Hello. Today, I'm going to tell you about the reproductive systems of many different organisms and different types of reproduction, namely internal and external fertilization. Internal fertilization occurs most often in land-based animals, although some aquatic animals also use this method. There are three ways that offspring are produced following internal fertilization. Oviparity, oviviviparity, and viviparity. In oviparity, fertilized eggs are laid outside the female's body and develop there, receiving nourishment from the yolk, which is a part of the egg. This occurs in most bony fish, many reptiles, some cartilaginous fish, meaning fish that have a skeleton made of cartilage rather than bone, such as sharks and stingrays. Most amphibians, two mammals which reside in Australia, and all birds. Reptiles and insects produce leathery eggs, as seen on the left, while birds and turtles produce eggs with high concentrations of calcium carbonate in the shell, making them hard, seen on the right. These animals classify as oviparous. In ovoviviparity, fertilized eggs stay in the female, but the embryo contains its nourishment from the egg's yolk. The fully developed young will then hatch, this occurs in some bony fish, such as the guppy, some sharks, some snakes, and some invertebrate animals. In viviparity, the young develop within the female, receiving nourishment from the mother's blood through a placenta. The offspring develop in the female and are born alive. This occurs in most mammals, some collagenous fish, and certain viviparous lizards. The most common example is us, humans. Internal fertilization has the advantage of protecting the fertilized egg from dehydration on land. The embryo is isolated within the female, which limits predation on the young. Internal fertilization also enhances the fertilization of eggs by a specific male. Although the production of offspring is less in size, through this method the survival rate of the offspring is considered much higher than that for external fertilization. Sea turtles are an example of oviparous internal fertilization. The female and male turtle will meet at a particular time of the year, usually travelling substantial distances in order to copulate. On average, sea turtles lay 110 eggs in a nest, and average between 2 to 8 nests a season. That means the sea turtles lay up to 880 eggs per season. Turtle eggs are laid onshore, underneath the sand. This allows for less risk of predation, whilst offspring are developing. Due to turtles being oviparous, less male gametes are required, seeing as fertilization occurs inside the female. This means that the number of male gametes as opposed to female gametes is very similar. An average of 700 to 1000 ma male gametes are produced. Because of their oviparous nature, male turtle gametes travel a smaller distance in order to fertilize. However, it is essential for turtles to copulate, as it is the only way the sperm and egg can meet. The great white shark is a perfect example of ovoviviparous reproduction. The pup grows inside an egg in the womb, then is born inside the female shark. The gestation period takes quite long. It is estimated that the pregnancy cycle is about 11 months. The typical range of a litter is 2 to 10 pups, meaning that there is usually around 10 female gametes produced, and once again due to internal fertilization, there is a similar amount of male gametes meaning there are around 15 to 20 male gametes. The male gametes have to enter the female, therefore once again, copulation is essential to the meeting of the female and male gametes. Female great white sharks will usually give birth every other year, meaning they have no rest in between gestation. When the pups are born, they will measure up to 1.5 meters and weigh up to 35 kilograms. In order to fertilize, the male great white shark must bite down on the female's dorsal fin for insemination to be successful, this is common across most sharks and is documented by the observation of bite marks on female shark fins. External fertilization usually occurs in aquatic environments, where both animals release eggs and sperm into the water. After the sperm reaches the egg, fertilization can then take place. Most external fertilization happens during the process of spawning, where one or several females release their eggs and the male release sperm in the same area. At the same time, the release of the reproductive material may be triggered by water, temperature, or the length of daylight. Listed are the advantages and disadvantages of external fertilization. Many say that animals that use external reproductive strategies are at a significant evolutionary disadvantage due to the low success rate of the male gamete finding the female gamete. However, 
Animals using external reproduction tend to have a much higher gamete production than those that use internal reproduction. This is a sea urchin, possibly one of the most interesting animals to study in terms of life cycle. They literally push themselves inside out to mature. Urchins will usually spawn only once per year, typically around spring when the size of the gonad is optimal. They release their gametes into the water column. This is known as broadcast spawning, where the mating of sperm and eggs will occur. During the spawn time, one male urchin can release up to one billion sperm. That's around 40 times the population of Australia in sperm. And a female urchin may release up to one million eggs. This ensures that at least one egg will be fertilized. The fertilization rate is incredibly low, with most spawn events only having a 1-2% to chance of success. In order to fertilize, the male sea urchin's gonad must be of an optimal size. Otherwise, sperm production will not be maximized, and fertilization rate will be devastatingly low. The process of seahorse reproduction is fascinating. Recent studies show that males and females were caught for several days. During this period, the male and female will seem to take part in a sort of dancing mating ritual. They will be seen swimming side by side at the same pace. They want to be able to mirror the movement of the other in sync. When it comes time to mate, the female will deposit around 1,500 eggs into the pouch of the male. The male will then fertilize the eggs and carry them for up to 45 days until the fully matured young emerge. During this period, the male seahorse will swell significantly, as seen on the right. This is supposed to ward off any predators. The parent seahorse will then leave the young seahorses. This means the young seahorses then have to fend for themselves. Leaving, leading to a mortality rate of 99%, leaving only around 1% of them to mature enough to be able to mate themselves. That concludes my presentation. I hope you learned something today.